We have so far looked at the sorting problem, which is one of the most com fundamental computational problems that you will encounter in computer science. Another fundamental computational problem is the searching problem. And here is the specification of the problem. You are given as an input a sequence of n numbers, say a1 to an, and you are given a value v. And you need to find out if the value v is present in this sequence or not. You need to search for v in this sequence. So the required output is that if v is present in the sequence, we return the position or the location where we found v. Or if v is not present, then we simply return, we, we simply flag that it's not present. We return some default value saying that we didn't find v. The most trivial algorithm one can think of to solve the searching problem is linear search. You simply examine all items of the or all numbers in the sequence one by one and check whether you find v anywhere. And if you do find v somewhere, you identify the location where you found it and you return at that point. Otherwise, you flag that you didn't find v. So assume that the input sequence is given to you in an array. Uh, a with indices 1 to n. All we need to do in linear search is to scan this array linearly from indices 1 to n and in each step check whether a of index which is the current element we are examining is equal to v or not. If we find at some stage that we are looking at an element with a value equal to v, we return the index, the current index at which uh, we are located and if we don't find v anywhere, then we will exit this for loop here. Having not found v anywhere, we will simply return at this point that we didn't find v. So not underscore found is some constant which is predefined to flag the fact that we didn't find v in the sequence. Now if we analyze this linear search algorithm, again we are going to do a worst case analysis. We are going to avoid best case analysis because in the best case you can find um, v at the beginning itself so that's going to take theta of one time but best case analysis is not really useful because anyone can craft a, a craft a particular sequence of size n and a particular number v such that v will be found at the very beginning so the best case analysis doesn't really mean anything the average case analysis is going to depend on the probability distribution of the various numbers in the sequence and how likely it is that one of these numbers is equal to v. So that's going to be a little complicated. So we are going to avoid average case analysis except uh, where it's going to be useful to do an average case analysis, useful as well as feasible. In general, we're going to proceed with only worst case analysis now. So in the worst case, we will end up scanning the whole array and not seeing v. Now scanning the whole array is going to take time proportional to the length of the array. So we can say that in the worst case, the algorithm is going to take time theta of n. So if it's going to take time theta of n in the worst case, it's going to take time um, we can say that it's going to take time big O of n as well as big omega of n. So the worst case is bounded from below by uh, some constant multiple of n and bounded from above by some constant multiple of n. Because it, uh, it it's going to take at least time proportional to n to scan the whole array. You can't do better than that. But it won't take you any more than some other constant multiple of n to scan the whole array. Because in each step you're doing a con constant amount of work. Now in a previous video we discussed that if the worst case time is bounded from above by some constant multiple of n, then one can say that the running time on all inputs is bounded from above by a constant multiple of n. So this big O of n uh, time complexity in the worst case is really an upper bound on all inputs of size n, not just the worst case input.
So for this reason, we sometimes indicate the running time of an algorithm as just big O of n in general. So in the worst case, it will be theta of n, but for other kinds of inputs, it could be something significantly uh, less than n, but one can still use big O of n to indicate that. Now, can we do better than linear search? We can do better than linear search if the input sequence is ordered or sorted. So one of the benefits of sorting is that it en enables us to do efficient searching. If the sequence given to us was completely unordered, we had no way to tell a priori where we could expect to find the value v. One had to scan the whole array. One had to scan every element of the array and, and check whether or not it's equal to v to be sure that v is not present in the array. But if the array is given to us in a sorted way, then one could narrow down one's search to a particular zone of the array pretty fast. For example, one could compare v with the value of the middle element of the array. One could directly look at the middle element. If v is equal to the middle element, we stop there. But let's say we find that v is less than the value of this middle element. So the value of the middle element here is a of middle. So if v is less than a of middle, we know that it must be present somewhere in the left half of the array, if at all it's present. It's possible that it's not present, but if we if v is present in this sequence, it must be present in the left half. It couldn't be present in the right half because the, the input sequence is sorted and we have figured that v is less than the value of the middle element. So it must be somewhere in this range. Likewise, if we find that v is greater than the value of the middle element, then we can restrict our search to the right half of the array. Because all elements that are larger than the middle element are present in the right half since this array is sorted. So in this way, by just one comparison, by comparing v with the value of the middle element, we can cut down the size of our subproblem to half of the original size. And then one can iterate doing the same in every step. So if we focus on, if we end up with v being greater than the middle element, we will restrict our search to the right half of the array. And again, we'll compare v with the value of the middle element in the right half. If v happens to be equal to this element, well, we stop and return at that point, return the value of the index of this element. Otherwise, we again, check whether v is less than this element or greater than this element. If it's less than this element, it must be present in the left half of this subarray, that is in this even smaller subarray. And if v turns out to be greater than this middle element, then we know that v must be present somewhere in the right half if it's present. So in this way, we will go on iterating until we end up with a subproblem of size 1 and we find that the single element we are looking at is not equal to v. At that point, we can declare that v is not present in the array. And if v is present in the array, then somewhere, uh, uh, somewhere down the line, somewhere during the execution of these iterations, we are going to find that v is equal to the value of the middle element and we are going to stop there. So, this algorithm is called binary search and it works by not scanning the array linearly but by repeatedly looking at the middle element of the subarray that you're looking at and using that single comparison to cut down the size of the subproblem to half of the previous size. So in the next video we'll look at the pseudocode for binary search.